Hi everyone, welcome to the You Gotta Act channel. I'm Manuela Lazic, film critic, actress, and filmmaker, and this is Take Two, a series where we look at some of the greatest performances in cinema to try and figure out what makes them so great. Today we're looking at the modern classic that is Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread. Quick reminder before we start, you can get exclusive essays accompanying each of these new videos, written by me, by supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash you act. Now let's get into it. It's not news that Daniel Day-Lewis is an amazing actor, but when he portrayed London fashion designer Reynolds Woodcock, he reminded us of his ability to really become his characters, adopting new mannerisms and speech patterns in an integrated way. I'd like to see who I'm talking to. In his second collaboration with Paul Thomas Anderson, he got an equally talented co-star to work with in Vicky Creeps, yeah. who plays Alma, a young woman with whom Reynolds begins a relationship that he thinks he's got total control over. The film introduces Reynolds as an elegant man with a meticulous self-care routine, and as a well-established fashion designer dressing the London bourgeoisie. But not all is well with Reynolds, and he needs a time out. I have an unsettled feeling. Why don't you go to the country tonight? On the advice of his sister Cyril, played by Leslie Manville, he goes for a weekend getaway in the countryside, where he will meet Alma. PTA closes in on Reynolds as he's getting thoughtful, staring down into space. But De Lewis is soon shaken out of his contemplation. Vicky Creeps brings a different energy into the room, not just when she stumbles, but also when she giggles at him. Reynolds is unsure how to feel. He's amused, but also tries to stay serious, whereas she is embarrassed, but mostly pleased and cheerful. There's a real connection between the characters, because there is one between the actors. Although they follow their own goals, being proper for De Lewis, waiting tables for Creeps, they also really notice each other. PTA is an actor's director. He leaves room to Day-Lewis to respond to what has just happened, because he tells stories through his character's emotions, and not simply through them delivering plot information to each other. Reynolds' introspection here advances the plot. Instead of allowing for a spontaneous reaction and interaction between himself and Alma, he seems to be calculating and preparing how to handle her. Alma returns more composed and professional. That's why she doesn't look at him at first. Yet at the same time, Creeps is still smiling a little, because she can feel his gaze and knows she's about to talk to him. Good morning. Good morning. What would you like to order? <clears throat> when we relate to other people, we always do so in a context. The relationship between Reynolds and Alma is that of customer-waitress, and the actors have to take that into account. Alma has regained her composure now, because she's at work, yet she remains flirty and was borderline unprofessional earlier. That's because Creeps doesn't just play a waitress, but she plays a full person with a certain outlook on the world and certain feelings. Alma is attracted to Reynolds, and she's not afraid to break with convention, which will become more obvious later. So Creeps has to adopt these preferences herself to play her. A Welsh rabbit. With a poached egg on top, please. Not too runny. And bacon, scones. Day Lewis lists what he wants with poise, like a polite customer, but also with malice, like a man flirting. He stares at Creeps the whole time, scrutinizing her reaction to his absurd order with a smirk on his face, because Reynolds is basically playing with Alma. He's testing the waters to see how far he can go until she laughs or gets offended. But when PTA cuts to Alma, we see that she barely flinches. She is smiling and patient. Butter, cream. Jam, not strawberry. No. Raspberry. What else? Coffee or tea? Do you have lapsang? Have a pot of lapsang, please. Good choice. Reynolds pushes the joke further by asking Alma to help him out with his ridiculous order. 
but Alma plays into his game. She looks amused but not annoyed. On the contrary, she seems to want this game to continue. She congratulates him when she says good choice. And some sausages. And some sausages. She does look surprised when he adds sausages, because, come on, but Creep subtly hides that reaction straight away under good manners. The only thing that can explain such an extremely accommodating attitude at this point is that Alma the woman, and not the waitress, likes this man. Show me. Will you remember? Yes. I'm keeping this. The final stage of Reynolds' evaluation of Alma is a memory test, which amuses him greatly and confuses her a little. DeLuis is delighted like a little boy, and Creeps quickly rises to the challenge. Her smile returns. The placing of the actors here is revelatory too. DeLuis is the one sitting down, looking up at Alma, but he's ordering her around, and his growing smile shows that he's enjoying being taken care of. And while Alma is serving him, she is the one providing for him too, and looking at him from a position of superiority. She is quietly smiling as well, because she enjoys being needed by him. And now? This hints at the way their power relationship will evolve, as we'll see, with each trying to control the other in different ways. Will you have dinner with me? Reynolds is satisfied with Alma and her great patience. Yes. She fits perfectly with his demanding nature. With her youthful demeanor and quiet voice, Creeps looks fragile, but when Alma takes out a note she had already prepared for him, she surprises both him and us. She was planning to ask him out all along. For the hungry boy, my name is Alma. Already we get the sense that Alma isn't the self-sacrificing little servant that Reynolds would be able to use as he pleases. She has desires of her own, and she will defend them. Good luck. Against Cyril's advice, Alma has decided to organize a surprise for Reynolds. A romantic, home-cooked dinner alone with him in the middle of the week. I love you, Reynolds. But Reynolds isn't exactly receptive to the idea. Yes, but what is this? It's a surprise. Are you hungry? Not only Reynolds couldn't be bothered to get dressed, but he drags his feet and never looks at Alma, who's waiting for and staring at him. While she smiles, he turns away from her to drink his martini. His behavior creates a horrible vibe between them. This is a clear rejection. How was your appointment with the princess? She tries to talk to him. She's very beautiful, like a sculpture of some kind. But the more she tries, the more irritated and avoidant he gets. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, will you make her a wedding gown? I have made her baptism, her first communion and confirmation dresses. I made the dress for her presentation at court, indeed the entire wardrobe for her coming out season. It's only right that I should make her wedding dress, wouldn't you think? Every time I watch this film, I have a different reaction to it. Sometimes this scene makes me upset and other times I find it hilarious. I think Phantom Fred is like a dark romantic comedy about two messed up people who fall in a sort of love and try to get what they want out of it. De Lewis and Creeps play those absurd scenes of conflict completely straight, taking their deranged characters seriously, which makes them at once disturbingly real and comically extreme. No, but this is not what I wanted to say. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what I said. I, this is meant to be a nice evening. Let me serve you. Alma is again serving food to Reynolds, like when they met, but she has a very different demeanor this time. She's not trying to play a game, or at least not his game, and Reynolds doesn't like it. Cripps comes across as much more vulnerable because, although she tries, she can't make DeLuis calm down and see things from her point of view.
Not only does Reynolds not pass the saucer to Alma, but he makes as much noise as possible when he puts it down. He's just as dramatic with the salt. He's like a tempestuous child playing with his food. Day Lewis's goal as an actor here is to signal his annoyance through his behavior, to get creeps to notice his feelings. He could just say that he's annoyed, but that's not what children do, is it? Do you like it? I do. No, you don't. You don't like it at all. Usually you always tell me what you think. What is this? You're lying. As I think you know, Alma, I prefer my asparagus with oil and salt. And knowing this, you have prepared the asparagus with butter. Now, I can imagine in certain circumstances being able to pretend that I like it made this way. Right now, I'm just admiring my own gallantry for eating it the way you've prepared it. I don't know what I'm doing here. It becomes clearer throughout the argument that Reynolds is using the asparagus to express how much he hates being told what to do which is why the situation is ridiculous. He's pretending to be rational, or he thinks he actually is. He's intellectualizing a situation that isn't about facts, but about feelings. She might have known that he liked his asparagus with oil and salt, but she was trying to be nice, and that's what counts here. This is a character trait of his. In a way, his dressmaking career is a result of his need for control. His job is all about details, precise measurements, and about his own taste and no one else's. So it makes sense that De Lewis adopts a calm tone to talk to creeps. His goal is to communicate his discomfort and to come out of the argument as the smart, fair, rational one. He uses fancy language like, I admire my own gallantry for eating it the way you've prepared it, because he wants to make his rudeness appear acceptable, because he thinks he's right to be annoyed. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just waiting around like an idiot for you. Alma is teary and has a moment of realization. Creeps looks down and turns her attention inward, because she's so hurt by this point that she can't just be nice and bear it anymore. De Lewis has managed to get his point across, and has triggered a genuine reaction in her, and she's been receptive to him. It's almost like they're both good actors who can listen to each other and express themselves effectively. This was an ambush, Alma. To what purpose? This is not... I know it's not going as I expected. I, I didn't mean these things to come out. I'm sorry, but it was meant to be nice. Well, what did you expect? I wanted time with you. I wanted to have you to myself. You have me all the time. No. What are you talking about? I don't. I, there, be, there's, there are always people around. And if not, then there's something between us. Something between us? Yes. What? Some... What? Distance. This is another moment where we see that PTA knows how to write characters. Alma is a complex person, and because Creeps is talented, she's convincing both when she's strong and when she's fragile. And unlike Reynolds, Alma is being straightforward and making herself vulnerable. Although she can play games, she's also able to live more honestly than he can. When did this happen? What happened to make you behave like this? Rather than acknowledging what Alma has said. Is it because you think I don't need you? Reynolds blames her. I don't. Well, that's very predictable of you. Don't act so tough. I know you are not. Yeah, that's right, that's right. If I don't protect myself, somebody will come in the middle of the night and take over my corner of the room and ask me about their fucking asparagus. Don't be a bully. You'll be there are a other bully. things I'd like to do with my time. It's my time. I have no idea my what time. I'm doing here in your time. What am I doing here? I'm standing around like an idiot, waiting for you. Waiting for what? Waiting for you. Waiting for what? Reynolds is defensive about his independence, but he doesn't consider Alma's feelings and desires. He brings the conversation back to the asparagus, because he thinks that all she cares about is whether he loves her. De Lewis's strategy is to talk to creeps in a demeaning way, to put her back in her place. But in fact, Alma cares about herself too. Now her words are finally going to break through his armor. Watch his face. Waiting for you to get rid of me. To tell me to leave. So tell me. So I don't stand around like a fucking fool. 
It's the first time that Reynolds has to deal with an unsatisfied girlfriend directly. At the beginning of the film, we see him rely on Cyril to get rid of his previous partner for him. Alma, however, won't give up without a fight, and she puts him on the spot. He doesn't know how to react to her fearless honesty. Creeps can look at him directly when she talks about him getting rid of her, but DeLuis has to look down. Asparagus. Is this all about your asparagus? No, it's not about what asparagus. What the hell is it about? Are you a special agent sent here to ruin my evening and possibly my entire Why life? Why are you so rude to me? Why are you talking to me like this? Is this my this? house? This is my house, yes, isn't it? Is, is this house. my house? Of course it's your house. Or did somebody drop me on what foreign soil behind enemy lines? You I'm surrounded on all sides. This is an instance where an actor does listen to his scene partner, but instead of reacting organically, De Lewis sticks to his goal of avoiding the topic. That's why he looks so disingenuous. He's forcefully refusing to react authentically, which is what we do when we don't want to admit we're wrong. It's you who brought me here. When the hell did this happen? Who are you? Do you have a gun? You're here to kill me? Reynolds is hanging on to his ability with words to protect himself, and Alma can only shake her head. He's not really interested in talking with her. Hmm? Do you have a gun? Stop it! Where's your gun? Stop being a child. Where's your gun? Stop playing. Show me your gun. Stop playing this game. I'm not I'm playing not. a game? Yes, mm-hmm. What uh -huh. game am I playing? What game? What precisely is the nature of my game? You tell me. Oh, this whole... What? De Lewis maintains his composure, which makes Creeps even more frustrated, which makes him act even more cool because he wants to be the calm one. This is how fights that start small can get huge quickly. All your rules and your walls and your doors and your people and your money and all these clothes and everything. This, this, this game. Everything. Here. The whole... <laughs> Nothing is normal or natural or... Everything is a game. Yes, mister. No, madam. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Reynolds only refutes everything she says, so Alma goes deeper. She calls his life a game, and Creeps' behavior becomes unhinged and a little ridiculous. She's not trying to look smart or calm. She's being frank and natural, which he never is. Well, if it's I my, don't eat if, this. If, I don't drink if, that. If I don't. If it's do my life that you're describing, it's entirely up to you whether you choose to share it or not. If you don't wish to share that life, as apparently it's so disagreeable to you in every respect, why don't you just fuck off to back where you came from? De Lewis remains stone cold and rejects her. Cripps is disgusted and worn out by this pointless exchange, and finally she gives up. But her physicality speaks a thousand words. She seems to be the one leaving him and not the other way around. In a way, she has won the argument, and she's proven that he was a child here, totally unable to have a genuine conversation. Alma has found a way to get Reynolds to need her. She can make him sick, to remind him that he's not invincible, and to literally become his carer. I take care of you. She's done that once before this scene, using poisonous mushrooms, and it resulted in Reynolds asking her to marry him. She does not fit in this house. Now, after he's expressed to Cyril and Alma herself that the marriage was a mistake, Alma thinks he needs another reminder of his own frailty. This climactic scene is mostly wordless. It's through the characters' behaviors that we get clues about what they are thinking and feeling. Creeps is focused. She looks a bit sinister, too. When PTA cuts to DeLuis working, we see that he has made literal the distance between Reynolds and Alma that she complained about, but also that they are in the same room. She is preparing the toxic mushrooms right in front of him. And although they are not yet interacting, and the actors are focused on their tasks, cooking and sketching, respectively, they are also aware of each other. You get the sense that Creeps keeps her gaze down and ignores DeLuis because Alma doesn't want to raise Reynolds' suspicion, but De Lewis glances over at Creeps and soon returns to his sketches. He too doesn't want her to notice that he's distracted by her quietness. When Creeps and De Lewis finally stare at each other, their gazes are cold and distant. They're like two animals keeping each other in sight. They're expressionless because they don't want to make any false move or reveal what they're thinking. But by looking at Reynolds, Alma has also invited him to observe her. She looks a bit more self-aware here.
From showing concern, DeLewis's face transitions to a subtle smile. Reynolds has understood the game that Alma is playing, and he's amused by her boldness. Cripps' smile is more forced and brief. She doesn't smile with him, because this isn't just a game for Alma, it's serious. Creeps takes her time making the omelette. She uses her favorite pouring technique because Alma is reveling in every step of her plan. While Reynolds can't return to his sketch. Focus is crucial to acting, and De Lewis's attention is split between his work and Creeps, with Creeps now taking over in his mind. Reynolds is a calculating, intellectual person, and you need a great actor to make thinking visible and dramatic, like here. De Lewis's body language translates Reynolds' anguish and uncertainty. PTA has the plate in the foreground, like a challenge eyeing Reynolds. De Lewis is ceremonious. His strategy to deal with his anxiety is to take it slow. Would you like a glass of wine? No, thank you. Can I make you a martini? Nothing. Creeps delivers her polite lines with malice. It's interesting to compare her demeanor when she serves De Lewis in the three scenes we've looked at. This time, she's more in control, angry, and self-satisfied. Water. Creeps approaches her role as waitress with a different kind of irony than in the first scene, because this time, Alma is the one who sets the rules of the game. Alma knows how irritated Reynolds gets when she's fussy at the table. Contrary to the first scene, she's now the one pushing Reynolds' limits, to see how far he'll go with her. And he drinks it up. This is almost a staring contest. Cripps' gaze is direct. She's daring him to eat. And De Lewis goes through the motions of the game playfully. But Creeps doesn't reflect his smile back to him, because this is serious for Alma. We get the sense that she needs to be certain he will follow her. So De Lewis goes ahead and chews, more seriously this time. Alma lays out the rules of her game, something that Reynolds himself never did. And then I want you strong again. 
Delois looks genuinely happy because Reynolds had never found someone who could do this for him. You're not going to die. You might wish you're going to die, but you're not going to. Someone who could deal with him and never leave him. You need to settle down a little. He swallows the poisonous omelette gladly. Kiss me, my girl, before I'm sick. The ending of Phantom Fred is romantic and sinister, and both Alma and Reynolds are at once relatable and creepy as hell. But the film itself is always a delight to watch because Paul Thomas Anderson wrote a brilliantly constructed script and still gave space to his actors to bring it to life. Watching Phantom Fred feels almost like watching an acting class, with two brilliant actors listening and reacting to each other and creating complex characters through their behavior. Sadly, Day-Lewis has apparently decided to retire from acting, but if that's the case, he couldn't have made a more beautiful exit. <laughs> and before I make my exit, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, let us know what you thought in the comments, tell us what films you would like us to cover on here, and don't forget our Patreon, where I write exclusive essays to accompany each new video. See you next time.